thanks everybody and thanks for taking the time to join this session. Uh, this is much appreciated. So we're here to talk about uh, the use of uh, AI uh, for TB case uh, detection in Nigeria. Um, over the next uh, over the next twenty minutes, uh, we'll first just have a working definition of AI. Uh, it means uh, several things to several people depending on what the applications are. Um, and then uh, we'll present an overview of Instrat's, um, you know, uh, disease surveillance and response uh, platform, which is our application of AI. And then we'll talk about its use for case uh, TB case detection in Nigeria. Um, and um, and then you know we'll we'll then rest on you know one or two use cases, uh, depending on how we uh, do with time. And then I'll lay out some of uh, my thoughts around uh, the future opportunities for applications of AI in uh, public health interventions in low and middle income countries. Uh, and then, you know, uh, also perhaps just share a thought of or two about some of the future work, some of the work that we're currently doing for the future applications of AI. And so, um, you know, to jump into it, uh, this is a definition, a working definition that, you know, I'm comfortable with, you know, which is that it refers to, AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. Uh, this term may be applied to any machine that exhibits traits associated with a human, with a human mind, such as learning and uh, problem solving. And so, um, you know, Oftentimes, it involves, you know, what is also is commonly referred to as big data, and that is just really crunching through large volumes of data to simulate uh, some of the uh, brain activities and come up with smart interpretations of that data that allow you to do things more effectively. And so we have applications, uh, including, you know, healthcare where you know, there are remote surgical procedures done, there's drug dosing, there's drug interaction, uh, using uh, AI algorithms, you know, in gaming, we all know, uh, you know, about the uh, really popular uh, IBM Deep Blue case. And I think, I forget the name of the chess champion that was uh, defeated by, uh, you know, by a computer. You know, in automotive technology, we we have uh, vehicles, you know, uh, that, you know, have actually now been uh, demonstrated to have lower accident rates than even in, uh, than, than humans, you know, we have, you know, my bank will oftentimes, you know, send me information on, um, you know, on some unusual credit uh, or debit card activity detected or even in, in, in trading. But I think that uh, for me, the most important uh, aspect of AI is that regardless of what it is, it is really theoretical if it does not re result in actions, in meaningful actions. And so uh, my addition is that uh, to this definition is that you know, it must be actionable, and it's really the actions that I think uh, really help move, uh, you know, make this uh, real for public health uh, interventions. And so with that said, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the system that we've developed for uh, detecting outbreaks, uh, disease outbreaks, uh, even before it starts. Uh, the purpose of this system is just, um, you know, to uh, use uh, available data and, uh, you know, provide situational awareness around case distributions, population characteristics, et cetera, that then allows uh, local uh, surveillance personnel, uh, program managers, policymakers, uh, you know, to take specific uh, you know, public health uh, interventions. And so we start with a uh, mobile field data collection tool. We have the, uh, we have a proprietary tool, but we also have the capacity to link with, you know, uh, many popular uh, third-party uh, apps. 
uh, including Calm Care, that was uh, built by uh, Dimagi. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, and then this data is uh, synced with remote servers that store, uh, process, and report. And we, the outputs that we generate uh, come in three broad forms. One is around uh, real time <clears throat> GIS heat, heat maps. The second is around, you know, uh, the reports and dashboards that we provide. And um, a third is around, you know, the uh, alert notification of, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a curious disease activity. And just, you know, uh, just the way this works is that if we have uh, disease uh, data baselines uh, and the real time data that's coming in uh, is significantly, uh, significantly deviates from historical baselines and that, you know, we automatically, uh, you know, there's something going on and then we have set thresholds as data exceeds those uh, threat, uh, thresholds, we send out what we call uh, an alarm. And so um, <clears throat> the alarms are based on AI. And the way that we've used this in this context is that um, we, have, we notify uh, the TB program managers of uh, the possibility of undetected community spread of TB. I'll talk a little bit more about the program itself and the objectives of the program, but just to give a sense for the volume of data that we uh, run through this uh, system, you know, we have approximately 100,000 data forms that are submitted to the system daily, and each data form has about uh, 20 fields. Uh, there's some with significantly more. And so, uh, so let's that kind of gives us a sense of how much data, and how it would be, you know, pretty much impossible to do this uh, manually or even with, uh, you know, other basic tools such as Excel. Um, the algorithms are run every other uh, Sunday night, uh, looking data for looking at the data for the last fourteen days. And uh, we generate alarms when uh, the data from local areas, in this case, we're uh, dealing at a ward level. Um, you know, I know that we're in a global environment now. So you think about country, state, uh, and then uh, in the Nigeria's context of the local government area. In the US, you'd refer to it as a county. And then beyond that, there's a ward, which is an aggregation of a few communities or a few townships. And so uh, if the data uh, from a ward exceeds the thresholds that we've set for that ward, then it could suggest that there's a community spread that's not been detected. And so we automatically generate an alarm uh, an email, and this is sent to uh, you know to people that are involved in the program, including the state uh, TB officials, uh, the program managers, etc. And then once they get the alarms, they mobilize and conduct mass screening outreach uh, at the locations uh, that are you know informed <clears throat> that the alarm suggests. And so with that as a frame. You know, I'd like to just talk about, you know, what exactly we've done in detecting uh, TB cases in Nigeria. So I'll talk about uh, the application itself, you know, uh, the, the application of this framework to TB case detection. And I'll talk about one or two, um, you know, one or two case studies, uh, depending on how we do with time. So I should start by uh, giving credit to USAID for funding this uh, activity. I should also recognize that this activity is led by KNCB, uh, KNCB uh, TB Foundation uh, that's based in the Netherlands, but they have, uh, we're working with the Nigeria office. And I should also give uh, credit to my technology partners, uh, uh, PLOS91, uh, you know, PVT uh, out in India. Now, um, we can see that the broad program objectives are really to uh, 
is improve improve access to uh, you know high quality you know person centered TB um, you know uh, to strengthen the service delivery reduce TB uh, transmission etc. However, if you don't find the cases, then you can't even begin to apply the interventions that allow you to achieve the objectives. And so the approach that we've taken is that where essentially, uh, you know, the, 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 the instrument panel that a pilot uses to fly, and without this instrumentation, the pilot's flying on its gut, uh, on their instincts. And, you know, sometimes they may be right, sometimes they may be wrong. And so um, you can see from the bottom right chart that the, uh, the area that we are uh, uh, covering is uh, approximately a third of Nigeria's uh, geography. And for context, uh, for those of us who don't know uh, much about Nigeria, it's um, a country of about 100 million people. And so the way that we use uh, AI in case detection is that using uh, the uh, application, and in this instance, we're using a third party uh, primary data collection application, uh, 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 ComCare. And so uh, this data collection is uh, used by hospital staff, uh, trained uh, patent medicine vendors, et cetera. Um, and then the data is synced, you know, offline uh, when there's internet, there's internet access in real time, it's synced in real time. And the data goes into the cloud where it's analyzed and then it's, uh, the outputs include the hotspot heat mapping, uh, you know, which is uh, done in real time based on uh, rolling seven days data. And then the alarms, uh, and the alarms then trigger the community uh, uh, screening activities. So this is essentially the, 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 the service uh, value chain. And so I wanted to just give a sense <clears throat> for what the data is. I talked about there being uh, significant volumes of data, but uh, there are three forms. The left is what um, we'd use for screening patients. Uh, primarily at the uh, patent medicine vendor level or the local community pharmacist. The first point when people start to exhibit even, um, you know, light symptoms that may or may not be uh, TB. And then, uh, you know, and then if they're screened and identified to be a potential TB candidate or presumptive case, they're referred to the hospital and they, uh, the, the workflows are such that if the patient then follows through on that referral and shows up at the hospital, this, the, the, uh, their, their information is already stored and pulled up where they then subjected to much uh, deeper screening. And if in that second level, they actually uh, found that they are indeed a presumptive TB case then they would have to go for uh, either clinical or bacterial, uh, bac uh, bacteriological, uh, you know, test for confirmation. Uh, so those are the, you know, the collection of, uh, you know, data fields that go into the system. And, um, you know, in terms of the analysis, we have uh, real-time uh, reporting analytical tables that provide uh, data on the entire TB care continuum activities, which is uh, defined as identification, investigation, diagnosis, and treatment. And we have, uh, you know, a number of analytical charts. We have uh, pre-formatted reports uh, that the system generates, you know, allowing um, program the program managers at the different levels, the national, the state, uh, and sub, is to generate and submit the reports, uh, you know, monthly or even uh, sub-monthly. And so, you know, the outputs also include uh, alarm heat maps. And the way that we've uh, framed this is the hotspots is that we uh, 
uh, identify or we, we capture GI, uh, GIS coordinates of uh, the patient's residence. So we're not looking at where the patient is screened because oftentimes the patients are screened, uh, the screening is uh, done outside of their communities. And so we capture the GIS coordinates of the patient's uh, residence. And that's what we use to populate the heat maps because they do go back home and that's where there'd be uh, the community spread. And so the heat maps will are then designed to show the hotspots. Um, and in this view on the left side of the chart, we uh, were showing the uh, the heat maps on a uh, you know on a uh, state level, and so every week uh, you know the way this is used is that uh, the teams uh, sit take a look at these heat maps and then decide uh, where to deploy their resources. And prior to these heat maps, they would work uh, based on instinct and based on other unconfirmed. Um, ideas of where that might be spread, but in this go, you know, uh, in a very targeted way. And then the right side is a typical alarm that we would send. And this is an email alarm uh, that goes out. And as uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if this is coming across, but you'll see that, you know, there's an alarm that goes to, uh, that identifies a state where uh, this, um, you know, where this, you know, uh, undetected community spread is likely to be as well as the ward. And then it also gives you some of the details around, uh, you know, the things like the uh, case count and the presumptive uh, to case ratio. So it gives you uh, the users all the information that they need to uh, go out there and conduct uh, additional uh, uh, community screening. And so which then leads to the action and the action that's uh, triggered in this instance is that once these alarms are received by, uh, by the program managers, uh, the state TB officials, uh, the team leaders, um, once they receive those alarms every uh, you know, other Monday, what they do is uh, they uh, pull themselves together as a team and they plan their activities with the state tuberculosis and leprosy control officers, the linkage coordinators, the patent medicine vendors, and the hubs. And then uh, they conduct uh, public awareness uh, campaigns, you know, of the intended mass screening in the affected communities. They do this through the community leaders, they do this at churches, radio jingles, etc. The idea is to attract as many people as possible from the communities so they can conduct uh, these screenings. And uh, they also conducted, uh, you know, you know, uh, as close to the index word, word as possible, you know, because that's where the uh, AI suggests that there might be a spread. And the uh, screenings are done at, you know, healthcare facilities, they're done at churches and where there's, uh, very um, poor infrastructure. We, we do it in, uh, you know, under trees in large, uh, you know, clearings. And, um, you know, once people are screened and their presumptive cases identified, they automatically refer to the nearest uh, healthcare facility for sample uh, collection. And once those uh, samples are collected and tested, uh, you know, they're followed up by the closest uh, program hospital reps uh, for treatment and uh, follow up. And so I would like to just talk about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some uh, initial uh, results that we're finding, um, you know, from the program. And uh, this is, you know, not official yet, but at least um, uh, this 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 program is less than a year old, and so uh, and so we're we're crunching through the data to ensure that there is actually uh, value in having uh, this uh, you know this approach. And what the data suggests here is that you know you know uh, between July and March of this year, we've identified we've generated 
approximately 420 alarms. And so there's been, uh, you know, there's been uh, cases, there's been wards where we felt, where we felt there was undetected community spread and, you know, everything, all the actions that I described uh, took place. And, um, and in the alarm areas where uh, they went to, you know, there was about approximately, two, approximately 268,000 or 269,000 screened uh, and they identified, uh, you know, detected 2,735 TB cases. And uh, conversely, there was in the non-hotspot of the control uh, areas, there was about 247,000 uh, cases uh, persons were screened and they detected 1,327. And so uh, the result here is that, you know, you know, a, a good way to, to think about this is to identify a positive TB case. Uh, they needed to screen 95 people in the areas where uh, we, ident we raised alarms. And in the other areas, they needed to screen 186 people or twice the level of activity. And so uh, this essentially demonstrates that, um, that the alarms help drive uh, a higher yield, programmatic yield, and the alarms you know, help uh, you know, use rec resources uh, in a more, um, you know, in, in a higher, you know, in, in a more um, uh, beneficial way, right? And, and so, you know, the, so far, what we're finding is that, uh, you know, high utility in priorities, prior, prioritizing activities based on hotspots and alarms than just on uh, experience and instincts. And, um, and, you know, we feel that uh, we're, we're getting increasingly convinced that this is the right way that we need to uh, take for uh, finding TB cases in, in Nigeria. And um, so I will, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, skip this other case study uh, and just uh, move on to, um, to the fact that, you know, we... Uh, being a new system that we've uh, deployed, quite frankly, in this, uh, the first time this use case was applied, we felt it was also important to check in with the users. And so we did, uh, you know, a focus is a survey, a quantitative survey that we sent uh, to about um, 60 people, 60 users. Uh, the end size of the charts uh, on the right side are. Uh, uh, 42, and so 42 users responded, and then we uh, conducted a focus group that had uh, 10 of those 42 people who are you know the highest utility uh, users to really uh, come in on you know what areas you know what features of this um, system they found most useful and uh, to identify ways that we can improve that utility uh, as well as uh, improve the, uh, you know, their user experience. And in uh, the surveys, as well as the focus groups, the users confirmed that the hotspot heat maps, as well as the alarms, helped improve uh, targeted screening. And so it not only, it, Spots and alarms not only help them improve, you know, uh, their planning, uh, their targeting, help them, uh, you know, conserve resources, but also, as I demonstrated, it also improved the yield of those uh, activities. And so, um, and so we're, we're kind of, you know, converging, uh, you know, with, you know, both from user experience. <clears throat> Um, the program yield, uh, the uh, deployment. This is actually uh, a very smart deploy deployment of uh, AI uh, for TB case detection in Nigeria. <clears throat> and so, 
I'd like to uh, close out my on this section with uh, some thoughts around uh, you know how this can uh, how AI uh, in this context can be uh, further developed uh, for you know increased uh, public health uh, you know interventions in lower and middle income countries and um, we've used uh, we've demonstrated the use for AI um, in the case of TB. I'm also having a, you know other uh, discussions uh, that could potentially lead to involvement of some uh, version of this technology for uh, uh, borrelia ulcer for leprosy, um, and so you know there there is you know obviously the opportunity to expand uh, this data to uh, you know all communicable diseases and even non-communicable diseases. Um, you know, a major area of work that um, Instrat is actually working with the University of Texas, um, you know, is to develop, uh, you know, outbreak prediction, predictive models using geospatial modeling and predictive analytics, right? And, um, and this is not, you know, for people who are steeped in, um, you know, very sophisticated uh, analysis, not uh, anything new. Um, you know, this is being done uh, significantly, but we're trying to bring um, you know some of these um, you know some of these ideas and these approaches uh, to lower middle income countries because uh, it's only relatively recently that we've had a significant availability of you know accurate uh, you know data coming in to inform types of modeling and then um, you know and then we there is an opportunity to uh, integrate uh, AI into national outbreak monitoring systems you know so that um, you know those things are uh, you know there's you know they're driven more uh, by smart technologies than just raw uh, numbers and uh, finally, uh, building the capacity of policy and decision makers to base public health uh, programmatic decisions and actions uh, on real-time data and an analytics. And this is actually one of my, um, you know, one of the things that I find, uh, you know, could potentially yield a really, really high, um, you know, uh, be high yield activity because you know, a lot of the people that make these decisions, especially as it relates to uh, resource optimization, uh, you know, program poli uh, policy, uh, you know, these are, you know, uh, professionals with the best intentions, but who've worked for most of their lives uh, basing their decisions uh, on their experience and their instincts. And it's not, uh, it's only recently that uh, the data science has allowed recent uh, real-time data, accurate data uh, to come into the picture. And so, uh, you know, so our experience is that we find, we're finding that there is a tension between uh, people's you know, uh, experience, the way they've been trained to work and the way they've honed their skills historically, um, you know, there's a tension between that and basing uh, their work on, you know, actionable, actionable intelligence, you know, especially when the data conflicts with uh, their uh, instincts. And so, um, it's one of these things that could very easily be taken for granted, but in our experience, um, we need to work together uh, with, you know, as a community uh, to help uh, understand uh, the data, help people understand uh, what the data is saying, what it means, but most importantly, uh, the actions. Uh, that, the data, that, that the data suggests and the potential 
uh, outcomes if those actions are taken and uh, uh, executed effectively. And so, um, and so I think that uh, the field of AI uh, is really important, uh, you know, for uh, lower middle income, uh, you know, countries, especially in the area of public health. So with that, I'd like to just um, uh, bring my uh, discussion to a close and open up for questions and answers. And uh, thanks again for taking the time to listen. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think there's, you know, having those alarms that target uh, can can pinpoint and target the resources where they're needed most is really critical and pretty amazing, actually. It'd be really cool to see numbers in the future, you know, if the program allows it uh, to see if it's helping uh, retain resources and save money or make sure that there's more supply and stock when it's needed and all that thing, all those things. Um, I did have one question and it, it actually relates to, I think what you were speaking to at the end there. And uh, in my experience, these challenges of these, these programs isn't necessarily in uh, the technology, but in deploying them in working with people. Did you have any uh, notable experience in training the community members that are doing this and the program managers? And how did that work deploying this type of technology uh, in the communities? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. And so the approach that we have taken uh, is based on the experience that we had, that the approach that we took in this program is based on the experience uh, that we that we've had prior to this program, which is that uh, it's not sufficient to uh, put data in front of uh, decision makers, and um, you know even with the proliferation of uh, you know uh, data visualization uh, on BI tools, um, you know that's also uh, we find that that's also not sufficient. And so, um, and so what we have done in this case uh, is we have uh, field staff that interact with uh, the program people at the field level. And so that we're able to contextualize the data that's coming in. And so we're not reporting uh, data and fancy charts. We're contextualizing every bit of information that comes into uh, that's uh, provided on any chart. And so the next thing that we do is we then uh, point out decision imperatives so that it's, you know, we have uh, data, context, decision imperatives, uh, so that, you know, ultimately, uh, what we uh, what we do is we lay out you know here are the five things that you can do in this quarter uh, to make the program more effective, and so you know we start with that and then we can work that uh, work that back and back that up with data and context, and so uh, we, we're finding that that's more effective than leading with uh, charts or with uh, data outputs. We have two similar questions, and I think you've been touched on the type of data that you were collecting. Um, but these two questions are, are are both asking: Is the system utilizing individual individualized facility-based data? And the common thread here is: If you do, what measures are you using to protect patients' data, uh, specifically uh, GIS coordinates, and are the patients aware of how their data are used? You know that those are uh, you know very good. Uh, questions are uh, very good questions um so yes um you know the, 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 we explain um the use of the data to the patients and so there's uh there's uh, an implicit there's an explicit consent uh to pay uh, the uh, patient's data being uh used in this uh context um and then as far as you know uh you know privacy data privacy uh, the systems all adhere to uh, the highest standards of data security, privacy, um, which is, you know, uh, which has, you know, which is very well, um, the protocols behind that 
uh, and the standards behind that are all very well established and we adhere to all of those protocols and standards. Excellent. Um, okay, let's see the questions here. Okay, right. So personally, I have experience not doing this work, but working in health initiatives in Ghana, a nearby uh, neighbor in Nigeria. And when we were working there, collecting a lot of data, we had partnerships. Uh, we were collecting data via SMS, and we had partnerships with the telecom industry. Is anything like that being deployed in your context in Nigeria to help maybe provide the community with hotspots to increase reporting rates or re reliability for your data collection? Um, yeah, so that's 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 also an interesting question, and so. Uh, in this specific program, no, uh, we're not doing that. We have other programs, uh, you know, where we've done this. But part of the reasons why we're not doing this in uh, this program, and this this argument can also end to other programs that don't necessarily uh, need is that, um, you know, if you're using two basic technologies, one is, you know, uh, your uh, 3G or your, you know, uh, you know wireless data systems, um, we don't necessarily need to get into explicit contracts with uh, telcos, you know, we can uh, buy data plans. And so what we do is we have bulk data plans that allow us to drop 5,000 uh, SIM cards into devices around the country, uh, for example. And then the other is uh, where you want to deploy, you know, whether it's USSD uh, technology or even um, have a, uh, the name, uh, the, the, the term skips my mind, but you know how you have a, a text message that you have, you know, maybe for, you know, text SDOP2. I forget the, 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 the term, but um, the bulk text messaging providers that work across uh, across telcos uh, to reserve those uh, numbers uh, across the telcos. And so um, so in yeah, so in Nigeria, uh, we have not necessarily seen uh, the need to work explicitly uh, with uh, tel with major telcos, but there are also other interventions where that's uh, important, especially if those align with uh, some of the telcos community social responsibility objectives. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, every every situation is different, um, and every telco industry in in each country is different. That's what, one thing I've learned over the years. Uh, let's see if we have any more questions. I think that does it for now. I'm sure that folks will uh, watch this session and reach out to you uh, either through the, the hop in app or uh, via email. For those of you still uh, on the line, there's more information about OK and the work that he does further down. Uh, you can scroll down past the video uh, and feel free to reach out to him in the networking sessions or, or otherwise. So I'd like to thank everyone and I'd like to thank OK for presenting today.